uh, to be here and to share the word of God as laid in my heart. I believe you've had a great week. Amen. Amen. Praise King Jesus. We've had a fantastic week, many things to be done. Friday we're here with the choir. Yesterday we had a big team that are going to pray, to pray for the church. And we want to encourage you that uh, if you're in any ministry and you're planning, as we're planning for next year, let us pray before you do your plans. Don't do what they sometimes do in government. We used to do this in government. It's called, um, uh, you know, you, you just add 10%. If last year you spent 10, 000, 10 million, you say now I'll spend another 20%. You just add 2 million and you pass for the budget to be approved. We don't do such things in the church. We have to pray. God may decide to tell you this year, please, you're not going there. You know, so don't just plan just because it's what you did last year, but let's believe God for what you would like to do for us in 2020. Amen? Let me ask my wife to come and just pray before I share this word. Give her a hand as she comes. Let's pray for the word. Father, in the name of Jesus, we once again come before the throne of grace as we prepare, Lord, to break the bread, O oh God, of life, which is your word. We want to pray, O oh God, my Father, that you be in our midst, O oh God, in the name of Jesus. We pray for the servant of God, my Father, whom you've given the word, Lord, that you may be able to strengthen him, may be able, be able to anoint him, O oh God, anoint his words, Lord, in the name of Jesus. Because your word says that your word is like a two-edged sword, my Father, and therefore as it got forth, my Father, it may be able to separate the flesh, O oh God, and the spirit in the name of Jesus Christ. We pray for the people that even as they receive the word, that, Lord, it shall be established in their hearts and in their souls, O oh God, and bring forth fruit. Father, we want to thank you and we want to bless you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Amen. Um, in the last three, four, five Sundays, we, the GO has been taking us through the five lords of the Philistines, and he has mentioned a number of things, talked about seduction, talked about, uh, I think idol worship is what is pending. We are waiting to hear about the idol worship. But he's talked about seduction, he's talked about deception, and last Sunday we were looking at, at compromise, compromise. So this morning I just want to attempt to add another feather uh, on the spirit of seduction, the spirit of seduction in the church that is brought through or brought about by witchcraft. And I'm hoping that um, I'll be able to deliver within the next 40 minutes. Um, <clears throat> deception is not new. Deception is not new. In fact, in these last days, the Bible says that uh, there shall be many false prophets who will come. But Paul mentions also concerning a number of apostles, um, as we shall see, that there were many apostles who came on board who, who, were, who wanted to place themselves ahead of Paul because they felt they had a better message. So deception is not new. It's as old as mankind. Eve was deceived. She had certain information, uh, but that information was queried, was checked, and she doubted herself. After doubting herself, she fell into the trap of the enemy. So Eve was deceived. Isaac was deceived by his son, who? Jacob, isn't it? Jacob deceived his dad. So it's not, it's not nothing new, all right? Jacob, after deceiving, was also deceived by his uncle, all right? He told him, you want a wife? Good, seven years. No, no, you take this one first and then take the other one, 14 years, okay? So deception continues to exist, but I'm happy to know that that deception stopped with Jesus. The enemy tried. The devil came and said, if you are the son of God, turn these stones into bread and eat. And Jesus said, it is written. He came a second time, it is written. He came a third time, it is written, and the enemy took off. And therefore, we have an example that we cannot or we should not or we may not be in that, in that position where we can be deceived. But there is a church that actually was getting into a certain serious deception. The church in Galatia, and I want to read, that, I want to read the book of Galatians chapter 3 from verse 1 to 3. Galatians chapter 3 from verse 1 to 3. The book of Galatians was written, or the church, 
Paul writes to the Galatians around 49 years. That's about if Jesus died at 33, and, then it, and he went to heaven around 33, that means um, around 13 years later, 16 years later, Paul gets converted. But uh, for three years, he was away in the wilderness, so you can remove three years, for 13 years, all right? Paul, 13 years after Jesus Christ left, he meets the Lord Jesus Christ, and he gets a revelation, and he writes, uh, he visits the churches. When he's converted, he visits the church, he visits the churches. They were basically in Galatia. Galatia was not a city like Ephesus. It was just a, um, it was, it was an, an area, they call it the southern part of um, Asia Minor, where Paul had visited in the first one of his first missionary journeys. And that's the place where he had visited, and that's the place where he had preached. And, uh, and of course, there were many believers um, who came to the Lord. A number of people we call the Judaizers or former Jews, and then there were also Gentiles. And you know Paul, the Bible says, according to his calling, he had been called to the Gentiles. And therefore, it was quite a tough thing to preach to the Gentiles knowing that Jesus was a Jew. And the Jews who got saved, they knew they were, they knew the law very well, and, 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 and Paul also knew the law very well. And therefore, moving from the law to grace was quite a challenge. And therefore, Paul writes to them, um, asking them a few questions, because there seems to have been a visitation in the church that had brought different kinds of teachings than what he had, um, he had actually uh, uh, taught them. Galatians 3 and verse 1. O foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you that you should not obey the truth? before whose eyes Jesus Christ has been evidently set forth, crucified among you. This only would I learn of you, received ye the the works of the law, or by the hearing of faith, are ye so foolish, having begun in the spirit, are ye made perfect in the flesh? And he continued to ask several questions in the whole book of Gal 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 Galatians, just asking a number of questions. Now, why is Paul asking this question? talking about bewitchment. We can be bewitched. Hello? <laughs> bewitchment is very You can't be bewitched. You can be walking properly, doing what you need to do. But according to Paul, here are people who had had the gospel. But there was a level of deception that had come into the church. There were men who were called Judaizers, and these Judaizers were men who believed in the law. You see, Paul was an ardent believer of the law. He understood the law. He knew the law. In fact, when he talks in the book of Philippians chapter 3, he says concerning the law, he was blameless. In fact, Paul, the Bible tells us that he took so much of his time to be above his peers. So he studied the law to the maximum. And therefore, in terms of applying that law, he was, no, no, no one could compete with him. But the Judaizers came to church. Paul had preached the gospel of faith, the gospel of grace, that is not by works. It is by faith that we come to the Lord Jesus Christ. But the Jews who are there, when Paul had left, came in and they started undermining what Paul had already established. And they wanted to ensure that whatever had been preached was being subverted by ensuring that faith alone cannot save. There must be something else. It just can't be faith alone. And it's very true today, brethren. I know in, in many of our religions, and I've mentioned this before, sometimes when you talk about salvation, it is so easy until people say, no, there must be something I need to add. I need to add on something to make this salvation solid. Friends, that is a deception. Salvation is received by faith. It is not by the works that you do. I know there are many I have approached and talked to and told them that, you know, salvation, you need to come to the Lord today. He said, but I'm not good enough. Can you allow me, first of all, to prepare myself to get saved? I tell the person, but what is there to prepare? All you have to do is to believe in your heart that Jesus Christ is Lord and confess him with your mouth. And therefore, any additional religion that adds other things, friend, is a deception from the pits of darkness. So Paul gets so much surprised. He gets shocked that these are people he had taken through the process of understanding that Abraham, who was 
our father of faith was justified by faith and not by any of his works. And the church is okay. They believe what he says. He lives. But later on he says, he picks, he picks the Bible says in, in the book of Galatians, he wrote this letter himself. Verse 6 and 9, chapter 1, 6 and 9 says, I marvel at how you have quickly removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ to another gospel. Another gospel. Today there are other Jesuses, by the way. Eh? You need to be very careful which Jesus you believe in. So even this time, another gospel had been preached. Now, the Galatians had grown to be very close to Paul. They were very good friends. In fact, the book of Galatians 4 and verse 14, he says these people received Paul as an angel. They loved him so much that they were willing to pluck their eyes for him. I don't know whether Paul had a problem with an eye somewhere and some brethren in the church, they said, Paul, don't worry. I can even remove my eye and give you. Can I do it? Because Paul says here, yeah, they were even ready so much. So in verse 15, chapter 4, verse 15, if you can, if you can run there, it says here that, um, uh, verse, uh, verse 14, but you received me as an angel of God, even as Christ Jesus. Where is then the blessedness you spoke of? For I bear you record that if it had been possible, you would have plucked out your own eyes and have given them to me. That's how close they were to Paul. But immediately Paul left. Some groups of people walked in. They started saying, who is Paul? Don't you know Paul is a Jew? Paul understands the law. And he's telling you, forget about circumcision. And just think about faith. It doesn't work. And of course, the people began to get influenced, moving towards what Paul had assisted in teaching and telling them. So this other gospel, what kind of gospel is it? In, in verse three, it, verse, chapter 3, verse 1, it says, it was the gospel of crucifying Christ afresh. In Galatians 3, 10 to 12, it was the gospel of going back to the law of works, back to slavery. Number three, it was turning back to the beggarly and weak things of the world. What were these? In chapter 4, verse 9 to 10, the Bible says here that, but now after you have known God, or rather are known of God, how turn ye again to the weak and the beggarly elements, where unto you desire, you desire again to be, to be in bondage? You see, the beggarly elements of those days were there are certain days you must keep. If you look at verse 10, there are days you must observe to be a believer. There are days and months, you, there are things you must do to be a believer. There are years you must observe to be a believer. So what had happened, the Judaizers moved into the church and they said, you know what? It is not faith alone, please. You must make sure you must observe the Sabbath. You must make sure on the third year you do this. On the fourth year you do this. On the fifth year you do this. Then your salvation is complete. Paul is saying that is another gospel. This gospel was taking them back to bondage again. Chapter 5, verse 1 to 12. Chapter 5, I just read three scriptures. Stand fast therefore in the liberty which Christ had made us free. When Paul went to preach in Galatia, he had preached a gospel that was bringing freedom from bondage. What was that bondage? The bondage of following the law. That was the bondage. Because the Bible says that if you kept one part of the law, you had to keep the whole law to be considered holy. That was a big bondage. And Paul says there is no way you cannot, you have received liberty already in verse 1, which Christ has made us free. And after receiving that freedom, and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. These same people were saying, the Jews, for salvation to be complete, you must be circumcised. So they're saying, so why didn't Paul tell us that we must also be circumcised? So they started moving with the flow of the Judaizers. The Bible says here that um, they, ha they had started using their liberty as an occasion for the flesh to commit sin. And Paul is saying, how can you, having started in the spirit, now complete in the flesh? For the Galatians to have behaved the way they did, according to Paul, it was purely an issue of control. They were new leaders in the church, and the only way they would convince them is to take control and to manipulate and to tell them the way the serpent spoke to Eve, did 
God say? The same Judaizers came to the, to, to, to the church in Galatia and, and told them, did Paul really say? Do you think it's really true? We are the true apostles. And of course, the more they listened, the more they were convinced. What was happening? Control was taking place. Judaizers were taking control of the people's minds was taking control of what they knew, was dispelling, was casting a doubt, a shadow of a doubt of what the people knew. And therefore, Paul, when he asks, who has bewitched you? He was really serious because something had actually happened. A spell seems to have been cast. Because when you say why, when, when you define the term bewitchment, because to bewitch is to cast a spell or to have an evil eye over someone for the purpose of influence or for the purpose of control. That's why bewitchment and Paul looking at it says, what has happened to you, church? Who is controlling you? If you check the dictionary meaning, dictionary meaning, it defines witchcraft as the art or exercise of magical powers. Now, I was wondering whether the, the Judaizers were exercising magical powers. Maybe they had started the process. The effect or influence of magical powers or an alluring or seductive charm or influence. Now, God's word goes further to say and identify witchcraft as the universal primeval religion of the fallen man. When man fell, they quickly went into witchcraft. Because you will see... Part of the works of the flesh is witchcraft and idolatry. Witchcraft and idolatry. Now, when Paul is talking to them about witchcraft, I think it's important to understand what is really the objective of witchcraft. If someone is coming and you're saying that he's, he's, you, you've been, well, I had this word a long time ago in Kisi. I think in Kisi, this must be a word in Kisi translated to English. It's called to be witchard. You know, who has witched you? You know, so if you find many of us preachers in Kisi, we say who has witched you it means who who has bewitched you. In short, that's the English translation. When you are doing witchcraft, has an objective. There are reasons why witchcraft is is actually practiced. There are four of them, but I'll focus on one, which is actually affecting the Church of Galatia. The first objective of witchcraft is to appease a higher spiritual being. Right? To appease a higher spiritual being. Number two, to control the forces of nature such as rain. You can go to a witch, witch doctor and they can do that for you. We have them from all our villages where we came from. We know those who are called rainmakers, isn't it? You know, in, in a place called Shubawanga where we always being told that their lightning is created by small kids. They just meet and say, uh, who, can, who can do a bigger one? Small kids of 10 to 12. Then the other one says, ah, that is nothing. I will show you another one. Those are kids, eh? So it is the home base of many of these things that we talk about. But it is there to control forces of nature. Number three, to ward off sicknesses. Maybe sicknesses, infertility. You are looking for, for those adverts that are next to your house. When you come out, you see an advert there saying, if you need business success, if you need... To find you are lost, uh, something was lost. Though that, that's, that's part of um, witchcraft, all right? Craft is a craft in witch or witchcraft, okay? <laughs> so the word of sickness, yeah, because we have aircraft, see you? Aircraft. So this is aircraft, planes. So witchcraft. So you know you can link the two and see what it means. So if you want word of sickness, you visit these people, talk to them. Finally, the one I want to focus on is to control other human beings. Controlling of other human beings. That is an objective of witchcraft. In the case of the Galatians, it was the desire to control other human beings as part of the works of the flesh. Galatians 5, 19 to verse 21. All right? Galatians 5, 19 to verse 21. My little children, oh, sorry, 5, 19. Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanliness, lasciviousness. Verse 20, 
Read aloud. Idolatry and witchcraft or sorcery. Witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, and so forth and so forth. So witchcraft here is actually a work of the flesh. It is individuals who want to control others. And here the church was being controlled. Judaizers have come on board and they're ready to control the church that was there. So this kind of witchcraft actually manifests in three ways. First of all is manipulation, so I can come in. I want to influence your thinking. That's part of manipulation. I influence your thinking. Or I intimidate you. Okay? I intimidate you. What does that mean? To bully, to coerce, or to force into making a certain decision. Or thirdly, to actually be, to dominate. The end result of witchcraft is to dominate. So the end result of what would have happened in this church was domination. With what? With the law. I mean, with the gospel of the law or the other gospel that Paul was talking about. Now, I don't know what your experience is, but if you are either living with people or you're in a community, and allow me, please, I'll use this. If you are in that category, forgive me. Okay, forgive me. If you are short, all right, you are short. You always want to be felt. Isn't it? So there must be a way you want to be known. And if you're one of these who wants to control, people who are short who have a certain weaknesses tend to use manipulation. I mean, you will keep on either being very loud or you'll keep on saying, shut up, no, even me, I can talk. Why? Because you want to be seen <laughs> as part of the manipulation process. If you tend to have the air around you, or you feel a bit strong, or you feel a bit, um, what do you call it, a uh, higher character, what would you say? You would um, try to use bullying. Because you feel you are, uh, I'm the boss here. So I, whatever I say, I will say as part of intimidating anybody who makes any statement. If your colleague is going to make um, a contribution, you say, no, 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 wrong. Even if you are, I'm the one who's right. At the end of the day, what happens? You feel intimidated. And what is the process or the end result of this one is basically, again, domination. You want to be in control. So those who tend to be weaker manipulated, but the stronger ones who t tend to, do, to, be, to be bullies. Now, what are some of the examples I can talk about? Um, domination, domination, domination. You can find that you have a husband who intimidates his wife by his anger. Because the husband is just, every time the wife talks, eh, and I look at you. Say something, you shout back. What happens? You intimidate your wife. There's nothing she will ever say. So who's in control? Yourself, the man. Why? Because every time you are approached, you get into fits of anger. That must be sorted out. It's called witchcraft. Controlling. Yeah? <laughs> Number two, a wife could manipulate her husband by crying all the time. You know, you are hurting me. <laughs> Until there's something called guilt. The man goes on a guilt trip. He feels, hey, you mean, you mean, you mean. Manipulation. And manipulation is as a spirit of witchcraft. <laughs> so please, be careful how you share your sentiments with your spouse so that it is not manipulative. Many times in politics, you find politicians manipulating many people. They tell them if, in fact, if you hear what's going on now in our current political situation in, 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 in the area near where they want to do a by-election, everybody is saying their own thing. So you have the people, the electorate are looking and say, do I go here? Do I go? Now, which one? Who is saying what? All of this, they're using manipulation. And the tool is to make you feel guilty. Once you feel guilty, you can do something. You have been manipulated. You think it's not in the church? Hey. In church, most often, and I think this is what our, um, our senior brethren in the ministry were apologizing the other day, that you know what, they will tell you, they, when we appeal for offerings, God has shown me that there are 10 people who are going to bring 10,000 each. 
My friend, you, you, so long as you know you earn more than 10,000, you have got 15,000 in the account, you say, that must be me. <laughs> if I don't bring that money, and he say, if you don't bring that money, you don't bring that. <laughs> that is manipulation. It is intended to control, and it is equal to witchcraft. We better recognize when people want to manipulate you. Because once you discover what is going on, then you know how to handle these things. Because the Bible says in 2 Corinthians 4 and verse 4, that the God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers. He has blinded their minds. So for them it's fine. But for us, it's also a threat that we can also be manipulated. All right? Hence, the people who are manipulating us, practicing witchcraft, and I'll, I'll show you how that happens through the people who manipulate. But as we are believers, we are also at a threat. Unless we are able to understand our position, if you recall what Gio talked about last week, understanding your citizenry, understanding what your call is, so that you are able to resist when the spirit of deception comes to you. So the God of this world has blinded those who, have, those who, are, who are unbelievers. But people who are habitual manipulators... Now, this is from the spiritual angle. When you are consistently manipulating or intending to manipulate other people, what happens, you welcome into your life the, the demons or the spirits themselves of witchcraft. They don't come on their own. You open a door for them. Because it's a work of the flesh. It's not a demonic assignment. It's the work of the flesh. I want to dominate. I want to be in control. I want to be in charge. And as you do that, you actually open a gateway and the spirit of witchcraft or the demons of witchcraft will come and reside you and it will no longer be the work of the flesh, but it will be a supernatural now attack or a supernatural event that is taking place through your life. And that's why person practicing witchcraft will say a word and it will become a curse. Why? It is being backed by that spirit that has been allowed into your life. For example, I don't know whether some of you went through this, but you, go, you take a spouse to your parents and they say, you can't marry this person. Hey, dad, what is it? Mom, what is it? No, 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 you can't marry this person. You go once, twice, three times. Finally, you tell, you tell your parents, I will marry this one. And if your parents or if your mom are under the influence of the demon of witchcraft, they will tell you, you will never be happy. My friend, you will never be happy. <laughs> yes. Why? They are, using, they are using manipulative spirits, but the spirit that is in them is actually doing what? Manipulating that relationship. They will use those words to make sure they manipulate that relationship until you are not very happy in that relationship. We keep on asking, what has happened to my relationship? I thought we loved one another. That word that was sent will actually, can actually affect you. And it can put you in a position of spiritual slavery unless, unless, unless you seek for deliverance. Because words spoken can only be broken, can only be broken so that you are actually set free. You can have pastors who seek control of their members, uh, of, their, of, their, of the congregation. There are things that they do. There are many of you who have given us testimonies how pastors will control your money. Every money you get, you bring to the church. My friend, if that is the kind of feeling you have wherever you go to church, then there is a problem with manipulation. There's witchcraft taking place. There are people, there's a testimony. I had of a young girl who was just married three, four years ago. She, I think the, the gentleman went and joined an, a cult somewhere. Whereas, when they got married, every week she would bring money home. After he joined this other influencing institution, there was not a shilling coming to the house. What had happened? Manipulation. The mind had been manipulated, and therefore he could not even come home with the money. All the money was going elsewhere. So you can find business executives or pastors who are taking control of their members, make sure all their money comes here, either through threats or whichever way, or in an office. In offices, there's a lot of manipulation that takes place. There are people who go to the office, immediately you go in, you don't remember a thing. You just... When you walk out, your mind is very clear. You wonder, what has happened the, the whole time I was here? It's because there is a use 
of a lot of control, um, okay, use of a lot of witchcraft in that office. Which means you as a believer, you need to understand the times and where you're working at. How do I deal with this kind of witchcraft? Now, Paul, when Paul looks back to the church of Galatia, he notices that there must have been a spell cast on the churches at Galatia. Because it has influenced their thinking. They are now feeling guilty to have believed the gospel that Paul preached. And because they were feeling guilty, they tend, they, it, it looked like they were actually being now influenced into following what the Judaizers were actually preaching. So it influenced their thinking to the extent even going back to the works of the law. My friend, if you have heard the gospel of freedom that you don't have to continuously shed blood through what you call animal sacrifice, it is by faith that you believe God and that is considered faith for you. Abraham did it, it was considered faith for him. And we are the children of Israel. And therefore for freedom, Christ has set you free. In fact, you don't have to do anything. And then somebody comes and tells you, no, you have to do something. I think there was a big problem in that church. If I'm told I don't have to do anything to go to heaven, why should I do it? But after them even being told that, they still felt they needed to add circumcision to the gospel that had been preached to them. They ignored what Paul had preached and began to hear other gospel that was being preached. This gospel they were hearing, law cannot justify. The law is not our faith. The law cannot give life. Neither can the law make us sons of God. But that is the law they wanted to follow. That is the law they were going back to. And therefore, the disappointment in the heart of Paul, that is it this gospel that I preached? Is it this gospel that I preached? How come you are being bewitched? What is this manipulation that is taking place in the church? Friends, today we can say there are many, many things that are happening in terms of deceiving. A lot of deceptions are taking place. There is a teaching going around that the wealthier you are, the more spiritual you are. Rather, God recognizes you, are, you as very spiritual if you are wealthy. So everybody is working hard to be wealthy because wealth is a sign of spirituality. It's a deception from the pits of darkness. Total deception. Jesus had nothing and yet he was the son of God. If he had nothing and he was the son of God, we are his followers. And therefore, that is a great deception. If you go to institutions or churches that tell you, you must be able to dress in a certain way for us to know you as a believer. If you remember the, the example our bishop gave last week on wearing headscarves. You know, we, had, we say that is our standard. But uh, wearing a headscarf does not make you a believer. Isn't it? Wearing a headgear doesn't, it's not salvation. If that is salvation, then it must be very cheap. Because all I have to do is wear a kilemba, and I'm saved. But it's not that cheap. Salvation is not what I wear. It is the faith that God has given me. The faith that I have to believe. That is the salvation. So when we as human beings want to control people, what do we do? We want to set down rules and regulations to ensure that the people follow us. If you remember the, the many cults that have taken people or taken the lives of people, the Jones case that happened place in 19, 1978, where people followed a cult and they believed. They were basically, their minds were just turned upside down and they followed blindly and all of them died. Why? Following cults. Many cults are coming up today. Why? Manipulation. God does not desire to control you or control me. God gives you the option to make that decision. So long as you pay or you take responsibility of every action you take after you've made that choice. That is how God operates. But human beings, the work of the flesh is to manipulate. The work of the flesh is to take charge, to take control. And we must notice, once we notice that, friends, we must say, you know what? This must stop. Jesus himself is our example. Each time he was approached by Satan, 
Each time there was a process of manipulation, the Bible says in the book of Matthew 4, 1 to 11, Satan had no answer to the written word of God. No answer. Every time they come with a word, do you know the word says if you throw yourself to the ground, the angel will come and hold you. Yes, part of the word. But Jesus said it is also written in the word of God. Friends, if you find yourself getting close to a position where you're being manipulated, know what the word of God says. Even as you come to this church, know what the word of God says. The Bible says, let us be like the Bereans who went out and searched the word. What does the word say? Is what Pastor Monyoncho is saying really correct? I need to ask him questions. I need to understand, is that really true? Because my desire is to be able to follow God and to come out of any deception that may want to follow me. What is the solution to deception? What is the solution to deception? There is only one door that leads to the kingdom of God. The Bible says in John 14 and verse 6 that Jesus Christ is the way, he is the truth, and he is the life. And those who enter through this door receive a supernatural, supernatural life. But those who enter through other doors, the Bible says you just find yourself in darkness. John 17, 17, Jesus says that your word is truth. Your word is is truth. Anything that does not harmonize with the Bible is error. Anything that says other than what the Word of God says is an error, my friends, that you need to identify so that you can know you are being exposed to deception and to deal with it. People are looking or people are following after signs these days. God bless you for not following after signs. Because if you are there are not many visible signs here, but they happen a lot in the spirit. They may not be physical, but they happen, by the way, but they may not be physical. But you know what? You don't follow after a sign. We, don't, we are not of those who follow after signs. We are of those who signs follow. Okay? Signs follow us. If you are truly called and a disciple of Christ, the signs will follow you. Today, Many follow signs and many are missing it. Many are missing it. Friends, may you not be found among those who are looking for signs out there. Because these signs cannot last. This is what I call feel-good factors. You go to a meeting and somebody is, you know, they are doing great things. And they are doing wonderful signs and you say, this is the place I will be. And unfortunately, you always go there for the signs. You never go there for the word. Is today, what sign will there be today? And you run there because you are expecting a sign. But it is the word that you are established in that brings the signs. Anything, friends, that does not harmonize with the Bible is error. For this reason, for this reason, every week we place here the scriptures that you need to read for the week. I don't know how many of you read. But let me tell you, I have proved beyond a shadow of a doubt. Reading the word of God protects you 100% from deception. A hundred, maybe a 10%, but that won't be true. A hundred percent from deception. Many of us we've talked to and we've shared have not even Finish reading the New Testament. And yet there's so much tests and so much trials and so much difficulties in your life. Why? You are not appropriating the solution. You are not appropriating what God has set for you. If Jesus could quote the word, why not you? Why not you? So I therefore challenge you, members of GCI, we cannot be of those that are being drawn behind by men and women who come, speak their own gospel, and we follow them. We must be of those who hear what they are saying. I check with what the word of God is saying. Confer. You can even consult. You can call us as pastors and tell us this is what we are hearing out here. What is going on? Because you are consulting and you want to understand. Only then can you be set or delivered from deception. Once you have been deceived, the only solution we are saying, the word of God, 
If it's very bad, deliverance. You must come, we take you through the process of deliverance. But the word of God can deal with the form of deception. Paul himself, this was not the first time. The church of Galatia was not the first one. Even in Corinth, men had crept unawares. And they were preaching another gospel. And this is what Paul says here. That the apostle Paul warns in the book of um, 2 Corinthians 11, 13 to 15. 2 Corinthians 11, 13 to 15. The apostle Paul warns the Corinthians against false ministers. And this is what he says. For false apostles, there are many we are seeing today. They are there, everybody now is an apostle, okay? We don't know who is the right one, but you can tell. You can look at what they are talking about. <clears throat> we are false prophets who have also come. And they are there. And when you hear what they are saying, you realize this is not according to the word of God. Even in the times of Paul, they were there. Why? Because the greatest deception is found in religion. Religion. And Jesus said that. I mean, if you looked at the way he was talking to the, um, to the Sadducees and the Pharisees, they had brought certain deceptions among the people. He says, what's wrong with you Pharisees and Sadducees? You spend so much time to make a convert and you take him to hell twice as fast. What is your problem? This is not correct. But the deception, greatest deception that Jesus or that he mentions is basically in religious practice. And Paul continues to say, for such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into apostles of Christ. And no wonder, for Satan himself transforms himself into an angel of light. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers also transform themselves into ministers of righteousness whose end will be according to their works. Friends, this is just a warning to us. The gospel that you have heard, may there be no other influence. Paul said even if an angel came, and preached another gospel, let them be a cast. Whatever kind of an angel it was, let them be a cast. So it's a warning for us as DCI. You may not get deceived from the pulpit, but out there where you are, there is highly likely that you'll be deceived. May you place the word of God in your heart as David cried, Thy word have I hid in my heart that I may not sin against you. May your ears be open to hear God telling you, This is the way, walk ye in it. May the word truly be a light unto your feet and a lamp unto the path wherever you'll be walking. Let this word of God be what directs you and not what people say, not what you hear, but what the word of God says. And I can assure you, Deception will just pass, and you will not be a victim of that deception. God bless you. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Let's be upstanding as we pray, please. Let's be upstanding as we pray. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Just open your mouth and thank God for the word. Just thank God for that word. We want to spend a few minutes just praying, just praying in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Father, I want to thank you. I want to thank you for that word this morning. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord God, that you've given us a solution to manipulation, Heavenly Father, to every deceiving spirit, every deceiving word that comes our way, Lord Jesus. I pray, Heavenly Father, that you will get it out of our way as we read your word, as we scrutinize your word, O oh God, as we build on your word, my Father, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank you for this word this morning. Thank you for this word this morning, Heavenly Father. I pray, Lord Jesus, Lord, as we focus, as we focus on you, as we focus on your word, oh God, Lord, I will be set free from every spirit of deception. Make me a follower of the Lord Jesus. Make me a follower of your word, oh God. May I not follow after signs, but may I follow after your word, oh God, in the mighty name of Jesus. Lord, I pray for the members of this church, O oh God. They shall not be followers of signs, O oh God. They shall be established in your word, Heavenly Father, in the mighty name of Jesus. Lord, we shall go beyond the church of Galatea, O oh God. That, Lord, we shall not be listening to, 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 to other teachings that come to 
discredit what you have established in this church in the mighty name of Jesus. I thank you, Lord God. I bless you, Lord. And I worship you, Lord Jesus. I give you the praise. I give you the praise, O oh Lord. You're worthy, O oh God. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. There is power. Thank you, Lord Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Hallelujah.